This week, we are going to go over the process we each take in building a deck. Now, we aren't claiming this is the right way, just our way. And I think we each do it a little bit different. But first, we'll cover highlights from the games we played, talk about stuff we've learned, and review some listener feedback. All of that and more this week on Commander Central. Welcome to Commander Central. Uh, we spent the whole weekend filming an anti-Trump freestyle rap video in the parking garage next to the studio, and that is not going to air now because pff, Eminem stole our thunder, so I guess we're going to talk about Commander or whatever. I'm Dana. I'm Max. And I'm Chris. You can find us on Twitter at CMDR Central, search us up on Facebook at CMDR Central, or find us online at www.cmdrcentral.com. And I just want to say that uh, Max's rap for the spiciest. Yeah. Spicy. Um, so anything exciting happened this week for anybody? Not really. Nope. I have a story. I had to go move my mom this weekend. She has a cottage in Upper Michigan, which is a quite a quite a trip from here. Um, <clears throat> so whenever I have a long drive across small town areas, I always check like Craigslist to see if anyone is selling magic collections that I could maybe buy. And I found one in a small town between here and there. So I contacted the lady who had advertised it on Facebook, and she said, yeah, I've got cards for sale. I still have them. They're from the early 90s, Ooh. which is always good, early 90s magic cards. Definitely. Uh, so I asked her how much she wanted, and she said $10. And at that point, you don't, I wasn't even going to, you know, it's pretty tough to lose money, $10 for early 90s magic cards. It doesn't even take, if they're alpha, beta, lands, who cares? Right. I mean, even if it's just like revised stuff, you, you know, who cares even then? Even if you're out $10, whatever. So I'm like, okay, let's make arrangements to meet. At the last minute, unsolicited by me, she sent me a picture of the collection. Because usually I ask, I say, can you send me just a you know quick picture so I know what I'm looking at? I didn't even ask her because early 90s, I should be fine. She sent me a picture anyway. And I open it up and it is oversized playing cards for doing magic tricks. <laughs> <laughs> and and here the, here's the part. So then she apologized. I'm like, that's not quite what I wanted. I was talking about the card game. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I was just hoping someone else could get some joy from these cards. I wound up meeting her anyway, and I bought them. <laughs> what? I felt so bad because she was apologizing. And it, it was like I was stopping to eat in the town anyway. So I'm like, oh. I'm like you know what? My son, I'll use them for us. So I, st- I actually bought it from her. I met her and bought them. Anyway, because I felt bad. Spoiler, I knew everything but that of this story. <laughs> so then I, but then I was like, that's actually, maybe that was, what, maybe she played me. She was like, I'm going to sell all these junk cards to this dude. I'm going to make 10 bucks. <laughs> so I, I got played by a lady selling me oversized playing cards. Stupid nerd. Yeah, I'm an oh. absolute nerd. So. Uh. so I did not come out ahead in that transaction. But my son has them and he was, he played with them for 10 minutes. And I think he'll, that, that's the end of that. A dollar a minute seems. seems I worth guess. It. Yeah, I guess. Um, how was everyone's games this week? Interesting. Well, first of all, I should note we had uh, Patrick Sapola. You can find him on Twitter at Detective Yarmus, and he is one of the hosts of the Commander Time podcast. I will put a link on our webpage for that in the show notes. And I got the show notes up last week. I was not sure I'd have everything up, but I did them. And by show notes, we mean like things we talk about links, not like our actual prep work show notes, because that. Looks like a serial killer's journal, and there's a lot of drawings of dicks in the margins. You don't want to see that, but this is like... <laughs> Have fun trying to right. decipher it. <laughs> but this is like actual notes about things that are important. So we'll put Patrick's Patrick's information and link to his podcast up. He came, drove over from Minneapolis to play with us last night. So we played, I don't know, like six or seven games with Patrick. and So that was a good time. So I want to say thank you to Patrick and shout out. And I think we're going to have him on the show. I'm not sure if it's going to be next week or the week after. We're going to record with him and talk about one of his decks, do kind of a decks you played segment. Um, so anyway, how are the games you gentlemen played last night? Well, you know, I had some awesome games right up to the point that you uh, vetoed Max and I out of the pod for some reason. Which game was that? There was, I killed so many of my friends last night, I don't remember. Was that the game he played Edgar and just ran us over? No, when, when we, they... we got up and the other pod was like, oh, oh we'll be right. done in like five minutes. <laughs> And Max and I got up and went up to the counter That's and we're right. getting drinks. And by the time we came back, they didn't even bother rolling for pods. They just took we a new pod them. and <laughs> let Go us play hang. over there. Yeah. <laughs> we were trying to switch it up a little bit. And, well, and also, we wanted to do the um, uh, Gonti versus Gonti match, too. So Ooh. That was a pretty cool game. I was curious to see what Patrick's take on it was. But at one point, I, I think they each had, because they just kept hitting one another with their Gontis. Perfect. 
And at one point, I think they each had like five or six things from the other person's deck out. I think there was four Lilianas in play at one point, neither of which were the, their own Lilianas. Like Patrick had two, <laughs> two of Blake's and Blake had two of Patrick's. So they were just basically swapping cards back and forth. Please tell me they were different sleeves. They weren't. Oh. At one point, they had to have a notebook out and they were like writing down whose card they have because they had the exact same sleeves. So they were oh, like having no. to keep a ledger of right? who had what. Yeah, that was... I, I do got to say, I loved his tokens that he brought for us. Yeah, he had, he basically, I think those were... Dry erase boards. Dry erase boards with a magic card on the back. Yep. That worked really slick. I like yeah. that. I drew my little beast guy with his sharp fangs. Yeah. Yeah. And every time I touched it to tap it, I'd wipe some of his <laughs> face off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was clever. I like that. Yeah, we had some really good games. I My Edgar deck, I was pretty happy with again. Um, and I forgot this last week. I went. I meant to make this mention when I was talking about the Edgar deck, and I went through all my draw spells. And the one draw spell I didn't mention was Minions Murmurs. Minions and Murmurs, excuse me. Um, and the reason I wanted to mention that, particularly because it was recommended to me by somebody online um, at Grubfellow, who's um, Dean Goody is his name. Dean recommended Minions Murmurs to me, and it's been a great card. And I've forgot like three times to say. On Mike, thank you, Dean, for the recommendation. It's been great. So I'm going to do it now, even though it's... It has been phenomenal. I've had it played against me. And I, I went to... When I won the game last night, it was with a shared animosity. Um, and I killed two people, and then the third person scooped. Because he could see he had no answer the next turn. And I also had I had it in hand that... I was at like 30-some life, and I had it in hand. And I had... So that, that meant I could have drawn... I was going to draw like 15 cards anyway. Definitely guaranteeing the win. But um, it's been really good in that deck. And you looked at me funny when I blew up your uh, that token doubler. Oh, the annoying possession. As soon possession. as you played it, and I'm like, <laughs> "Why did you hit that?" And over the uh, what was uh, your enchantment, Max? Um, I had a privileged position. Privileged out. position, and I was just like, "Okay, we're playing Edgar." Yeah, no, you you can't have that. I, I may not have been honest when I uh, asked that question. I was absolutely the correct target. Or like your comment about um, it was just a precon. <laughs> well, the commanders were precon. It's a few other cards, but not not many. <laughs> and, and let's just mention that Dean is also a, one of the other hosts of Commander Time. He is, yes, he is. So those are, I would check out their podcast if you haven't. Those guys do a good show, um, and they've been really good to us um, in a lot of ways. So thanks to Dean and to Patrick. Um, did anyone learn anything last night? Stuff we learned. I have one I'm going to mention. And you, um, can, you can go first then. I'll go first. Um Man, people really need to figure out what their win condition is in decks. I'm not going to like single out anybody because I don't think it's worth mentioning players, but like there are situations where I play against decks and I'm like, this deck is, has no way to win. And, and the person hasn't thought about it. And, and maybe some decks, maybe your win condition is just, I'm going to do creature beats because that's all there is in some decks. My recce deck, it has creature. That's what it's going to do. There's no combo. There's no other way to win. Now, I may get there via, you know, overwhelming stampede or. A big Genesis wave or... Into a Chroma's Memorial, into Haste Creatures, <laughs> and combo win. Which is how I actually won the game last night with that, that big <laughs> Genesis wave and hit a Chroma's Memorial. Um, but there are... But, but I know what it is. Like, and, So you should at least have... People should, when you're building a deck, look at it and say, okay, how do I win? How do I get to that win condition? Because there are cards in most colors that you could put in a deck that gets you there. And I, I play decks where people don't know what their win condition is. And I'll tell you what, it, Lab Maniac isn't a win condition if you don't have a way to make it win. If you're just like, maybe the game will go on three hours, I'll be down to one card, and I can play Lab Men and win. That's not a, that's not a win condition. And then it gets Force of Willed. Right. Or just that this is never going to happen. Like, you can't rely on that reliably to actually win the game. You're just never going to get to that point. So I think more people need to focus to actually ask themselves that question. How am I actually going to win a game other than hopefully dropping enough creature damage in a deck. Because not all decks can do that. A Merfolk deck's not going to win via beats easily anyway compared yeah, to really like have a Stompy to deck. Up. Right. So anything from you guys? I was going to pretty much say the same thing. I okay. <laughs> I realized I don't have a, a clear win condition in my Brago deck. You're, but you, well, and I've noticed that about your Brago deck too. Like There's a lot of times you play it and you control the game. Like really like yes. you control the game for the first 95 percent of it and then you can't finish nope i typically win because the other player knows i have a lock of some sort and they'll scoop and they scoop not me ever <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. i i really need to analyze that deck and definitely find a win con for that what were we talking about last night um 
You're talking about some bird or something that you were debating on putting in. Nate suggested Hushwin Griff. But was that the one? Yes, but that's the one that allows ETBs not to trigger. It's okay. like a torpor orb on a body, which doesn't I, work. I thought Bravo. you had to suggest the one about when it comes into play, each opponent sacrifices a permanent unless they pay oh, so much mana or something like that. one of the pirates <laughs> from... <laughs> from Pirate Stompy? Yeah. But it's a five drop from Mercadian Masks. When it ETBs, each player sacks a permanent unless they pay three mana. Early game, that's great, but late game... Who isn't going to have three mana? Okay, I could see that. And five mana is a lot to get it out. Right. Although when you play it, it triggers, then you can blink and it triggers. That's mm-hmm. still six. But it, it, again, that's kind of one of the things that the deck does where it puts a vice grip on people, but it, that doesn't win the game necessarily. No. And you're trying to avoid the stasis winner or blocks type of deal. Correct. Right. Well, if anyone has any suggestions for a Brago win that isn't a stasis lock, um, Send them in via Twitter or whatever. Max will gladly listen. Oh, yeah. How about you, Chris? Anything from you? Um, mm, can't really think of anything I learned. <laughs> you not already off, know mean, everything. Yeah, no, I'm not ever going to say I know everything, <laughs> but the game is pretty much played out as usual. Um, I guess I learned... The biggest thing I learned was with Glare of Subduel when I was playing against you to pick the targets properly, and I think I did in our game. Yeah, we had a situation where... Chris had a glare out, and I copied it with Mirror Mastery. Yep. Yes. Um, and so we're like, we're like, you're like, okay, I'm going to tap down this guy. And I'm like, in response, I'm going to tap down this guy. And I'm like, in response. So we went back and forth and tapped each other down. And I think you hit most of the targets that had to be hit. Yep. I left up uh, like three snakes and a death gaze cockatrice or whatever. Yeah. And I still think I wound up killing you a little bit later on, but um, that bought you that Yeah, by with sure. like 30 snake tokens and uh, copied... Uh, Eldrazi Monument and oh that yep that's what it was because even then you're like I don't know why you're, why are you killing me and I'm like I have a plan trust me I have a plan and then we got kicked out of the pod I know <laughs> right right jeez <laughs> uh, all right so any news this week Max we do have a little bit of news uh, this week Wizards kind of let us get the first look of Explorers of Ixalan it looks like it's going to be a four pre-constructed deck set with a board game aspect built in yeah something like that. Yep. The reason we're talking about it is, though, there are quite a few high-value uh, cards that are being reprinted. Some notable ones being Shared on Animosity, which is roughly around $16 right now. Uh, Time Warp is around 14 And Day of Judgment, a, a nice four-mana Wrath, is coming back in this set. I'm, I was actually kind of surprised. I was expecting this to be like kind of the Planeswalker dual decks where unless you're a brand new player and you're looking to pick up something that are not much used to you. Right. But there's actually good reprints in there and, and it, it it's something new too. I might give it a chance. I was Did you guys did they spoil the art for the cards at all? Some of the cards there's at least two cards that had new artwork. That's what I was curious. Two about. of the reprints that had new artwork. So it's okay. not all That's cool. old stuff too. Um yeah, I'm no. more I'm more interested than I was anyway. I know I heard about that today. And it was brought up, and someone's like, oh, they're reprinting Day of Judgment and Standard. And I'm like, no, 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 <laughs> they're not. I was like, I heard, I could have sworn that I had heard that they swore up and down they would never reprint a four-mana Wrath and Standard. Thank you, Supreme Verdict. Exactly. <laughs> um, well, that was just a misprint there. You don't ever print a Wrath that can't be countered. Yeah, yeah. I think they might have learned the wrong lesson there. It wasn't that, that it was a four-mana Wrath. It was that it was an amazing four-mana Wrath in a meta with a bunch of amazing blue cards. And in the perfect color base for a right. control shell. Right. Yep. Anyway, anything else? Yeah. We have a new world champion of Magic the Gathering. And it wasn't really... I mean, he blew through that event. Yes. Uh, William Huey Jensen was crowned our world champ this past weekend. He went in... Before the finals, he went 14... And three, and he, and, and first day he was undefeated, I believe. Yeah, he went seven and zero on day one, and he didn't lose until around round thirteen or fourteen, something like that. At that point, you you really You're, don't care that you take a loss. It's no. more of just a if I can scrape through this match, not burn too much, you know, my energy, and I'm still making top eight. Right, right, yeah. Notable thing was he actually won it in his hometown. Yes, yep. That really, was cool. yeah, in the building across the street from a building his fa- his grandfather owned. Nice. Up. So it was a cool little heartfelt moment there. Yeah, I made for a really good story. This it was. I watched the finals. It was really. I'm not a big standard guy, but wow, that was intense magic. It was, they were. It was. There were good matches too. Down now, to the down to the wire. It was Ramnap Rabbit and Teamer Energy in the yes. finals. Yeah, 
And I think we also had some 1v1 news this week. Yeah, so... Uh, no. <laughs> Chris, you want to talk about that since you are our resident 1v1 player here at Commander Central? Well, okay. So this is just off the top of my head. I don't have it pulled up. But Brawl and Emrakul both got banned. Yep. Awesome. I'm so excited for that. OG Emrakul, right? Yes. 15 okay. drop. Haste, Aeon's torn. Yep. Take off. Or take another turn, whatever. You yep. know, protection from all colors. Arkham Dagson got unbanned. As did Yisan the Wandering Bard. Ooh. Um, and then all your good tutors got banned. Yes. Your mystical, enlightened, demonic, vampiric, but they left worldly tutor in. They did. And Imperial Seal also got banned. Imperial fans. Seal as well, yeah. Well, whoever's running Imperial Seal, awesome, man, because <laughs> I don't have the money for one of those right now. <laughs> So how's that going to change the format? Um, I noticed a lot of guys changing their decks around. There was a lot of Brawl decks. Yep, Brawl pretty much died. Um, I have a friend who plays Brawl, and he actually changed it up to Arkham Dagson. Okay. And changed it harder combo than he was in Brawl. Brawl was more of a control shell into combo. For me, I play Gitrog, and in my opinion, it killed my deck because I lost Demonic and Vampiric, which were quick tutors to go for my combo pieces to win. So, and I really don't want to start running more of the four mana, five mana tutors because right. they don't really pay off in the long run. So what are you going to switch to? I am going to switch to something we're going to talk about later. All right. Sounds good. Um, anything else we have? Um, any feedback on social media, Chris? Yes. We heard from uh, Caleb Rideau. He sent us a deck list on Hakon, Stormgald Scourge. Uh, we are currently going over your list right now, and we are planning to talk about it more next week. Yeah, we were kind of we just basically like joked about Hakon last week because we we're talking about knight commanders and like, oh man, that's a you could play Hakon, but you have to use Command Beacon to get him out. And he actually has a deck list that looks pretty tuned. So I think I, I looked at it briefly, but I think we'll spend a little few minutes talking about it next week. Yeah, I would love to. It's just a cool commander. And I think I checked an EDH rec, there were less than less than twenty five decks using him as a commander, so fantastic bonus points for that yeah big time now does this uh deck list up on tapped out it is no and i'll put a link to it in the show notes now on tapped out with someone else's deck list can i play test it or do i, th I have to do it think myself you, i think you can I but worst you can. case you can i know you can copy it with like two key clicks and okay do that's it yourself, i was wondering because i would love to play test through it without having to actually proxy the deck up we will verify that as well and put that in the show notes awesome all right, so let's get to what we're going to talk about this week, which is building a deck. Like last week, we talked about evolving a deck when you were having problems and making a big tonal shift. But let's talk about the steps we take when we actually go to build one. So first things first, what's the first thing you do? Do you start with a commander that you like and then build the deck around it? Or do you have a theme that you have in mind or colors you have in mind and you look for a commander or... A mix of both. What, what is the most likely thing you do? Most likely thing I would do is pick a commander. Um, there's been a few decks that I've picked. I pick a theme because I just want to hate someone. Sure. Okay. Um, but usually I just pick off the commander to begin with. So you see a commander and you're like, okay, I, I like this guy. What can I do with this commander? Yes. How about you, Max? I, I think I'm a pretty even split. Usually it's either I have an archetype that I want to build because I don't have a deck that fits it, so... I don't have a token deck, so that might be my next deck I build, or okay. I don't have a Voltron deck. And then the reverse is, oh, that new legendary creature from that new set looks really cool. I want to build it. It's usually the same for me. I, it, it, I, it's like a 50-50 split. Um, it's usually more leaning into a seeing a commander and going, oh, I, I have an idea for that. Um, but occasionally there'll be something. I wanted a landfall deck um, way back, even before Battle for Zendikar, so I picked... Damia. I picked Damia. Because it was in the landfall colors for the most part. And then when Om Angry Omnath came out, I switched to Angry Omnath. And Angry I, Omnath. <laughs> <laughs> and after that, I went to Mean and Dead. Um, but that was that was theme first. I wanted to do that, and then I found commanders that matched it. But usually it's a seeing a commander and then going, okay, what can I do with this commander? The next thing then is once you have that commander, once you've picked what it's going to be, then what's the first step you do? You're looking at your shiny new commander. What's the first step you guys take? I look at what the commander does and then build off of there. For instance, um, you're talking about my 1v1. Yeah. I'm currently building Noyandar. So now Noyandar reads, whenever you cast an instant sorcery spell, you may put three plus one plus one counters on target land you control. If you do, that land becomes a zero zero elemental creature with haste that's still land. So then I'm going to want to start playing more instants and sorceries in that deck than over creature base. So you're, so you're going to start looking at it and going, okay, this is what I want to do. 
and I'm going to start throwing cards in that match my theme. Yes, because it's going to be more of a let's create lands into creatures type of theme and protect them. And are you doing that from memory the first time? Just like, okay, I know off the top of my head that retreat from, I forget the, what the... Blue... Ameria, I think it yeah. is. Yep. yep. I know that has a landfall theme-ish thing, so that'll fit this yep. deck. So. Um, anything with uh, 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 Awaken. awakening, is that yep. what it's called? Awaken, Awaken or whatever. Um, yeah, go pretty much that route. And then you're going to, of course, you're going to need your cantrips because it's white and blue. So sure. you're just going to get value off of that, draw cards, and create a creature. But the first thing you do is you're going to look at filling in the holes with things that match what you want to do. Yes. How about you, Max? I I go with the support card, so if I were to build a token deck, I'm going to go with the cards that support the token theme, your doubling seasons, your parallel lives, your anointed processions. So let's say you pick Reefs of Redeemed. Like, okay, I'm locked in. I'm going Reefs for tokens. First thing you're going to start doing is, well, obviously, I'm going doubling season. I'm going parallel lives. I'm going anointed procession. You start act, adding those yep. cards that work with it first, too. Yes. Okay. I go lands first. First thing I do is lands. Really? Because... Otherwise, I look at it like, because you don't have, you really don't have 60-some slots to fill in a deck. No. Or you don't have 100. You've got 60 to yep. fill, because you're immediately, every deck's going to have 35 to 40 lands, probably. So I immediately throw in, I, first site, I go to, I go to Mana Base Crafter, and I'll put the link up on the website. And a Mana Base Crafter is a website where you can pick. Um, your general. Your general. And then it'll tell you every legal land and mana rock available in that commander's colors. So the first thing I do is like, okay, I'm going to build, um. Well, I'll, I'll use Edgar for an example because I that's my most recent deck. I know I want to build an Edgar deck, so I'm like, what are my options in Edgar's colors? And I just went down the list. Okay, I'm going to throw – I knew I had Shock Lands. I knew I had a couple of the Fetches. I knew I had every one of the Pain Lands. So I just started filling in with lands. It doesn't have to be exact, but like I, I'll, I'll throw in the basic dual lands. Look at my total. Okay, I'm at 25 or something. And then I'll say, okay, I'm, I'll just put in four of each basic to get me up to 37. That's good for now. Now I'll tweak that later on, but first things first, I'll get I'll get at least a rough count of lands put in the list. That way, I'm like, okay, now I only have to find sixty, you know, three cards for this deck list to get it up okay. to where I'd, I want it to be. I guess I do something similar. I don't actually go land based, but I put like I have a piece of paper next to me, and I write you know hundred cards on top, minus the thirty seven gives you sixty three cards. Okay. And then I know I can only play sixty three cards, so that's what my deck has to consist of. I don't actually go through and put the lands in. I just know that it's okay. that many lands have to go in. I do something similar. I know I have around the, the 63, 65, depending on color, stuff like that. And the main with. reason I started doing that is because I, I would get so frustrated when I would build a deck and I'd do the lands last. And I'd look at the and I'm like, I'm at 137 cards. <laughs> like, <laughs> at least if I have the lands in first, I, I eventually quit adding stuff. Or it, like, makes me, it takes an editing step out. Now, I do believe Commander is the only Magic format that you are required to have a maximum deck size. Yes. You can't go above that. Yep. Yeah, it is. Because all the other ones, you it's minimum right. deck size. Now, Chris does, you, now you mentioned doing this by pen and paper. Is there any particular reason? Because I build mine online, and I think Max does As too. do I. Is there any particular reason you like doing it by pen and paper? I guess I'll just be straight up and honest with you guys. I'm too lazy to pull my laptop down <laughs> in my basement and bring up the stuff. So I just have my notebook next to me where all my cards are sitting and that's, go from there. That's a legitimate reason. My, my dream would be to have like an office where you have like an entire wall that's painted in the whiteboard paint <laughs> and be able to. <laughs> oh, that on would that. be awesome. <laughs> that's so what I would want to do. So you're like the uh, the guy in the in the crime movie trying to like figure out you're gonna have the, the string board with all the stuff. Yes. To, Nice. I actually that would be pretty awesome. Couldn't we just put up like glass and you could use like erasable markers on glass around your walls? So we start with lands, tumble filling in theme cards, and then I usually probably after I get the lands, I kind of look at that too. So I'm going Edgar. So I'm, do I want to? Is there some vampire stuff I want to put in like shared animosity right away? I know I'm going to run or noted procession. So I start doing that too. Um, so then you start looking at okay removal is usually my next step that I'm like, okay, every deck I run, no matter what my theme is, no matter what I'm doing, I need to have a couple board wipes. I need to have a couple targeted removal spells. So I'll just add a few of them. And again, I'll, I'll tweak that later. But like, I've been building decks so long at this point, I know what my targeted removal spells are going to be. Mm -hmm. If it's a red deck, I'm, I'm running a Chaos Warp. If it's a green deck, I'm probably putting in a Beast Within. If it's a black deck, there's probably a go for the throat. If it's white... There's a path to exile, and there's a source of plowshares. If it's and a return to dust, probably. It's like I have a few removal spells I know I'm going to add, so I usually add those basics in because you have to remove stuff, you know. So I'll start start with that route. 
Do you guys do that? Do you have like a, a removal package or a utility package you usually kind of go with? I do have a removal package, but it's the last, besides lands, it's the last package I put into my deck building. Okay. Is there any reason why that is or just that's the way you do it? Because I think it's always pretty much the same cards depending on what color sure. I'm in. Yep. It's kind of like the land shell. I know what duels are going to go in there. You know, if I'm playing white and green, I know I'm putting Beast Within, Path, Swords. Right. I don't need to worry about those up front. I can cut something for those if I have to, or just remember save five spots. I tend to start with draw. I start with okay. my draw mechanics and go from there. How about you, Chris? Well, I'm a very messy person when I create a deck. <laughs> I go through everything and I make a huge stack of cards. So you're like oh. you're like literally building decks, like straight up, re- re- legitimately building them as you're going. Yep. You're not... In hand, go. I have yep. seen this happen. Yeah, it's fun to watch. I like that. Just a huge stack of cards. Half of them probably won't get played. Sure, but they could. There's always the possibility that you're looking at it and you're like. Well, this could go with this, and this could go. Oh, yeah, those all work together. Maybe we'll try it this way. So now, so this is kind of a side question, but so how do you have that stuff sorted? You just have your cards when you're coming to get those like basic staples and stuff out that you're digging out. Do you know where they're at, and you pull them out? Yes, of, okay. I have a couple of boxes that are playables, and then oh, I have yeah. my bulk. Okay. And I go through my playables. And I'm like, oh well, I wonder if there's anything in the bulk. So then I'll sit for like four hours and just go digging through bulk. Sure. I'll see you, if I have it. Anything for you, Max? What's else? How do you do that? So I do everything online. I don't. Right. I have too much bulk. Not mine's not sorted <laughs> to playables <laughs> and bulk. Mine's binders that are worth money, and everything else is bulk. Okay. So I'm not going to go dig through ten, five thousand count boxes to find that awkward common from Time Spiral that I might run. Right. So I usually, I do use EDH Rec for a little bit. I try to compare against if I'm picking a commander. I look at top five list kind of see where they the commonality is see where the differences are and get it for ideas i don't copy i don't do anything like that but i mean every restack pretty much is the same so it's hard not to b- build a restack that isn't going to match someone else's so okay edh rec every, people use that yep. <laughs> I, I use it as well just yep. to so, get a basic understanding of what could be played so at what point in this in in the deck building process do you hit EDH? you said you do it pretty early on sometimes depends on the deck um i try to save it towards the end especially when i'm in that 90 to 100 range or sure. that cutting from 110 to, to 100 now that's usually one of the last that's like my polishing thing i'll i'll get the deck mostly where i want it and then i'll go to EDH track i'm like okay wh- what did i miss All right and i also tend to use then after i get to that point too i'll do like a web search for Say I'm building Edgar Markov. Edgar's not a great example because it's so new. But like, if, if it was an older commander, then I would also do a search for, you know, whatever deck lists, and find uh, maybe threads on MTG Salvation where people discuss stuff or old Reddit threads where people talk about it and just go through the thread and see what people have have commented on about a certain commander. And because you find some stuff there too. I mean, EDH Rec is just so easy though. There's just cards there, and it's, oh man, I missed this one thing. Of course, that's got great synergy. Yep, I have done. Um Seeing how I have a Merfolk deck in mind, um, for since I'm doing Noindar for 1v1, I want to build Merfolk for multiplayer. And I did a gatherer search for Merfolk. I highly suggest you do not ever do that. You will sit for four hours <laughs> oh, yeah. flipping through yeah. pages on gatherer. But, but if you can get good at filtering stuff on gatherer too, it's also a really good resource. Yes. Yep. I also recommend Scryfall. Scryfall does a, does a really nice job too. Their yep. advanced search is a little more easy, user-friendly yeah. than yes. gatherers, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, it yeah, and it's still pretty clunky. I think Scryfall does a really nice yeah. job, and Scryfall I think has prices embedded into yep. the cards as well, so you can like, oh, here's a great card. Oh no, I'm not gonna run that. That's 112 dollars. Um, so that's actually really nice about Scryfall too. Mm-hmm. As for my card situation, I've got my stuff's pretty well sorted, except for the stacks of things that you could see in that picture I posted in the show notes last week. <laughs> um, well, because you're probably like me during the summer. You don't do anything with them. They just stack up, and yes. then winter time you take care of it. And I've started lately, actually, the last week or two, I've been sorting those stacks that were in that window picture because I've actually got that office cleaned up now. So I've been sorting now through those those stacks of cards. But in addition to that stuff, I actually have a, a an EDH staples box I have where I've got, like, you know, hey, there's two Vandal Blasts floating around in there, and there's, you know, an Explosive Vegetation and a Sky Shroud Claim. I don't always, I don't always use all those cards, but, like, 
for the most part, if I want my staples, I'll flip through there because I've got them sorted by color in there and I can look, okay, I think there's Swords of Paul shares in here and I think there's a, you know, whatever I'm looking to grab, I can usually have it in that binder. So is there any specific um, things you set to look for amounts? Like, do you always have to have, I think I might call this like a security blanket. Do you feel weird if you're not running three board wipes or 10 ramp spells or, or like, is there something that you always, that's your go-to in your decks? that you want to have a certain number of? I think not specifically, like in general for me, if I'm playing specific colors, like if I'm playing Mardu or Boros, yep. I know I need more mana rocks than other stuff. Okay. Where if I'm playing anything with green, yeah, I want every ramp spell that I could probably put in there just because why not? That's green strength. Yeah. Sure. I think the one card that I play on pretty much every deck because my decks are always two or three colors is Chromatic Lantern. If you're, I, would, I think it's always it's in every one of my decks. Unless you're playing like CEDH, where you're playing super cutthroat and there's just no room to breathe, man, I, I would put Chromatic Lantern in every three or more color deck. Yep. Yeah. It just fix. It just solves so many problems. There's been legitimately games I've won with missing a color. Like I can think of games that I've actually won despite not having a mountain or not having a red source because I drew a Chromatic Lantern on turn three. I remember that I, game. That was a really good my rip game. And no one even noticed until the game was over. But, like, yeah, it, it, you can do that with Chromatic Lantern. So, for sure, I agree. So, you said aside from lands, right? Yeah. Because I was thinking um, the other thing would be guaranteed lands to keep on color curves, such as seeing how I play three or more colors, like your Mana Confluence City of Brass or something like that. I mean, for me, I actually do have, like, if I'm playing three or more colors, City of Brass, Mana Confluence, and Exotic Orchard are my three that I will have in the deck for sure. Yes. I think Meteor Crater is pretty decent reflecting pool, but when I'm doing, and, and maybe later I'll add those depending on what the colors are. And because some decks I have, like my Edgar deck, not that dual lands are cheap, but like the three dual lands in that deck are all under $100, and I had two of them already. So I wound up trading in a bunch of stuff to Card Kingdom, and I bought the third one, which was a Badlands. Yeah. Um, but if that was like a, um, I'm trying to think what it would be a terrible color combination for money. Um, is Just Guy bad? No. Um, Just Guy would be bad, or Grixis. Grixis, Grixis would be bad, be or rough. Teamer would be bad because you have basically your blue green, your blue reds. Anything requiring blue, blue, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anything requiring tropical islands or tundras or volcanic islands. Obviously, you're not running. Probably, I'm not running dual lands in those decks anyway. Okay. So that changes what I'm doing. But in that Edgar deck, I have all three duels. I had the shocks, I had the fetches, so that at that point, it's a lot easier to not have to run the reflecting pool and the meteor creator. So speaking of duels, I'm going to bring this up. Patrick's wonderful comment to us <laughs> when we all were playing duels, and he's like, I'm sitting over here, and I maybe have shock lands in this <laughs> right. deck. <laughs> right, yeah. We, we The first game we played with him, I think we all had a dual land out yep. like in the yep. first <laughs> returns. You did. You had your bad lands out, and Pla I dropped. I had a plateau out. Yep, and I dropped my my. Savannah. Uh, Savannah right yeah. away. And I think I took a picture that that was the picture I took for Twitter. And you can see, like, there's, I, I was looking at this one, like, there's a revised duel and there's a revised duel. And a blood crypt. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, well, and that's, I mean, that does change how you build your deck if yep. you have access yep. to those cards, for sure. Um, I guess another thing that I could think of would be a sustainable card draw source, such as Sylvan Library, and if you're playing gr any Tarda Green, uh, Black, um, Phyrexian Arena, Blue. Uh, Ristic Study or mm -hmm. Mystic Remora. Well, talking about safety blanket things, that's what mine is. Like, I will throw as much draw into any one of my decks as I can put in that deck. Yep. And see, that's why I start with draw because I'm like, okay, sure. if I can't keep the gas going, it's going to be harder making cuts for stuff that synergizes really well to make room for draw. Where I'd rather, I need these eight draw spells no matter what. Yes. In every deck. Okay, so now I'm down to. 60 spots in my deck right. versus 67 or 68. You know, so Yeah, I'm not sure, even though I, I talk about that being my safety blanket, I do do that second after I do removal. I don't know why that is, but that's the second thing I add is the draw um, after removal. And I also tend to not count creatures towards stuff. And I don't know why. I was just going to ask that. I don't know why, but like I never count Acidic Slime as a removal spell, and I never count... Um, Consecrated Sphinx is a draw spell. Okay. And they are, but I don't know why I do that, but I always feel like that's a bonus on top of it. Versus Just the bread and butter. They're, yeah. They're more, in my opinion, it's, they're scarier than a Rhystic Study or a sure. 
a basic draw a Phyrexian Arena because yeah, particularly Consecrated Sphinx. Yeah. If it sticks out for you know one or two turns, even it pays for itself. If it sticks out for six turns, it's you a, won. It, you've pretty won much the game, game over. But you can also drop a Consecrated Sphinx and immediately need to towards the, towards the plowshares. Yep. Whereas that Ambition's Cost draws you three cards right there. I mean, you've got them in your hand. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, that's why I kind of treat it as like a bonus on a creature particularly. Unless it has an ETB like... Cloud Blazer or Yeah, or something Moldrifter. Slime does, but for some reason I just I never think of it as one of my removal spells. But again, I tend to... I'm only running it in one deck, my Glissa deck, because it has Death Touch. So I just think of it as a Death Touch creature. I don't think of it as a removal spell. Yep. Um, even though it definitely is. Um, so, ramp. Where does ramp come on this? And do you have to have ramp in every deck? Yes. I think it depends on your meta. I think there are probably some metas where it's not that important. I think where, even though I don't think our, our meta is that, our meta isn't cutthroat. But it's not introductory. It's not introductory, in part because everyone's been playing at this point for the most part. Most of them, I mean, there's kids that are, there's kids in our meta that are, you know, still in high school that have like three or four years of commander experience. I mean, even those guys in our meta have been playing for a long time. Yep. Um, as for ramp, I would say yes and no. I guess it depends on your build. Now, if I were building mono red goblins, there is no way I would jack that full of ramp. My goal is to drop sure. them out, crinkle into everything, and just obliterate you. Now, if I'm playing, let's say, um, green Omnath or something like that, yeah, I want the ramp because I'm going to be dropping some big beaters and stuff like that. Is there anything, talking about ramp is a good example, but is, is there situations where you specifically avoid something for a deck just to just to keep your deck different and, and, and let's say well here i'll give you one example my glissa deck um, is a green deck but i've intentionally put no spell ramp in that deck there's no cultivate there's no kadama's reach there's no sky shroud claim i've got no there's not i, have I no never land, thought about that i have no spell land ramp in that deck i've never noticed yeah particularly because it, I, I can recur artifacts so like yep expedition map and and things like that will get me a, oh, a land geez. doesn't it doesn't put it into play um wayfarer's bobble puts a basic into play yep. i guess but i can recur those and I, so i made the choice that this will be my green deck that doesn't have any of those green ramp land spells and i have i don't i don't have it built anymore but when i had my mimeoplasm deck i intentionally put no counter spells in it even though it's blue because it was going to be my blue deck that didn't have any counter spells in it Okay. Just to do that, just so I could say, this is a blue deck, I'm not running any counter spells. Interesting. Um, it fits my theme, because my Sagarda deck is an Enchantress deck, but I intentionally am like, no artifacts in this deck, so so I try to do that with all my decks to keep the, to keep it from every deck having, hey, it's green, therefore I'm putting this five ramp spell package in it. Gotcha. Yep, I can see that. So do you guys do any of those kind of things with decks, where like you're intentionally trying to tweak things a little bit? Um, I know with Ural, I do the same thing with uh, no artifacts. Okay. But that's just because Ural needs as many auras as possible. Right. I mean, in that deck, like, yes, technically, Wild Growth is, not technically, Wild Growth is worse than Soul Ring. But, like, in a deck where it's an aura that draws you a card, if you have one of your six Enchantresses out, it's, yep. not, that, it's not that much worse. Yeah. And it powers Ancestral Mask, and it powers Ethereal Armor, and stuff like that, so... Yeah, it's I, that totally makes sense in those kind of decks. I do not do anything like that. No, okay. But I play more towards the theme of the deck in general. And I would say this. It's not like I ever play your decks and go, it's exactly like every other deck Max plays. Right. Your decks definitely feel unique when I play against you. Yeah. So when you get down to the end and you're sitting at 105 or 110 cards. I wish. <laughs> is it more than that for oh, you? Oh, yeah. I have gotten better that I, I used to get to that 125 point and start making cuts. Nowadays, when I build it, I usually don't get much. I'm usually at like 105 to 110. Um, is there any particular criteria you have when you start making those cuts down? Oof. I'm, I kind of first start looking, I do the reverse order. Do I need all my creatures? Okay. Now, yeah. if it's a deck where I'm only running like 15 creatures, I may totally ignore that, those set of spells, because I don't know th- if I can go lower than sure, that. Sure, you hit a threshold, and like, I can't go less than this right. amount of creatures. In my and then I move to the artifacts, and then I, I just go through each spell type, and I try to not touch my removal or my draw, and I try to make the cuts in there. Okay, I go through and I look at it because I love creatures who have additional abilities. Okay, yep. So I might actually pull, let's say I'm running a Banisher Priest, I might pull a Banishing Light for the Banisher Priest. 
Okay. Just because I'm getting a dual threat. It's not only a creature, but it's also tagging something out right. of the game. Yep. Um, I don't know if I have, I've, I said I've gotten a little bit better at cutting it down. One of the things I've found that works kind of well for me is look at it and be like, okay, I think I can do without this card. And then I just drop it and go to bed a lot of times. Or something. <laughs> yeah. And like the next day, it'll either be nagging me like, man, I need, I, that card should be back on that deck or it won't be. And I can usually tell after I sleep on it the next day, I'm like, it, whether or not it'll bug me. I, I did this when, um, when Ixalan came out, I, I was debating pulling one land from a bunch of my decks. And so I did. I made the change online. I didn't actually change the deck. I'm like, okay, I'll pull one out of these decks, one out of these decks. Because I was adding quite a few of the, the enchantments. Legendary uh, flip enchantments. The legendary flip oh. enchantments. I'm like, technically they turn into lands. So I, I can pull one basic out and I'll put this in. And particularly the white one. And then that it turns one I can into see. a land really easily. And after think, just after sleeping on it, I woke up the next morning and I'm like, it's too few lands in my one color decks because my one color decks, most of them were at 36 lands. And I dropped to 35 and it just didn't feel right. Now, maybe that's my in my head, but like it bugged me. Like being at 35 lands did not feel like I had enough lands. However, I dropped my Edgar deck was at 38. And I dropped it to 37 and I, it didn't worry me. And then it hasn't played poorly either. So I think the, Aside from Edgar, the biggest drop I've seen come out of that deck is um, uh, Kalidas, F4 mana. Yeah, yes. Yeah, the, that's the biggest, definitely the biggest vampire. In that. Um, there's the one that when all vampires attack... He's a five drop. He's a, is he a five drop or a four drop? Like maybe a four drop. Maybe. Just one damage each player for each vampire, vampire attack, attacks. and you gain yep. that much and I, So I can see you cutting a land in Edgar because you, the curve is so low. Right. Now in Edgar, you run in all the mana rocks, too, because does running, that factor it, in? Um, it does, yeah. I don't have a hard and fast number. Like Supposedly, there's formulas where you know you take 40 lands and then minus one for each two mana rocks or each, or each two something ramp like spells that, or yeah. something. Okay. I never do that. Like even in decks I have that are my mean in Den deck has quite a few ramp spells just for the landfall triggers. And I'm still running thirty seven lands in that deck. Um because it's easy to be like, okay, well you just take a mull and you'll eventually get those three lands in your first hand or something most of the time. But then you miss that then you then you can miss that land in your fourth drop or your fifth drop pretty easily. So I think you need to still have some density of lands. Again, if you're playing C D E D C E D H where it's gonna be over in turn five. Well, those three lands are probably enough for you to combo out and win. Yep. But if you're playing long games that go 10 or 12 turns, and ours usually go at least 10 turns, if yep. not more than that, um, I don't want to be missing lands on turn four and five. So No, I've noticed out of all the formats, this is the one format I don't get quite as frustrated when I'm getting flooded. Right, yeah. Compared sure. to if, <laughs> if I get mana screwed, oh, man, <laughs> uh, then I'm in a bad day. But I get frustrated when I get flooded. Really? Yeah. Well, and that's one thing that draw helps with, too. If you're running like quite a lot of draw in your deck, too, it helps you, number one, hit those land drops and get past those points where you're flooded, too. Yep. See, being flooded doesn't bother me because I always have something to do. I'll cast my commander and jam him into a blocker. I don't even care because guess what? I have something to do next turn again. <laughs> I guess that's one way to think about it. I would rather just draw something that does something now. I could see that. So you've got your deck down to 100-ish. Play 100. You've made your cuts. You've done it successfully. So do you just go to the store and play it? Or is there something else you guys do at that point? Do you just goldfish out hands? Or what's what's your step at that point once it's done? Goldfish for many, many, many tries. Nice. Okay. And, you, and, you, and you legitimately do it with like the actual cards? Yes. How about you, Max? I. So this is a two-step process for me. If I'm, I build it on tapped out, and I will gold fort fish just the deck itself play out you know turns one through five yep okay against just you know it's goldfish and you know oh it's perfect because I'm, I'm not hitting anybody right yes and then if i'm happy with that after doing that probably for a dozen times i open a second tab up and i randomly pick another one of my decks and so you play your deck and i against play each against each other oh see i like I, that I do, I do similar but i do it with actual with cards legs. okay um you know, I usually try to play it against my Dramoka deck to see how if it battles against an all-flying deck. And then if that goes well-ish, <laughs> I then play it against Brago, a more controlly deck, to see how that goes. Okay. And then once that's done, and if I'm happy with the deck and I start buying the cards, putting it together yep. in, in physical form, I then do the goldfish process over again in person just because 
the computer can only randomize it so much. So right. much. And it probably randomizes it better than what you do when you shuffle. True, but I just I like the feeling of shuffling it, knowing like okay, I, I probably shuffled bad versus stupid tapped out. You didn't shuffle it well enough. Right. Okay. And I kind of I don't do that next step, and I probably should. I like that idea of of doing head to head decks. But I do what you said. I, I use tapped out. Um, there are some things I don't love about tapped out, no. but the fact that you can deal out a hand. And you have a battlefield that you can drag cards out to, and you can see how your t- first five turns essentially play out, um, is really really useful. So I tend to use that before I build the deck, because you can really tell a lot. You're like, oh, I feel like I'm not hitting land drops here, or I feel mm-hmm. like I'm doing nothing until turn four. I, or I have I have twelve mana rocks and I haven't seen one. Right. Yeah. You, so you get kind of get a feel for it doing that. Um, so that's what I do. But I like the idea of playing head to head. Yeah. Um, now, one thing none of us have really done much of, um, I know Cockatrice is really readily available, and there's a lot of play test groups who use that. Um, actually, Patrick and Dean from Commander Time, we've, we've mentioned yep. earlier, um, they play a lot of Cockatrice together for deck testing. And I really should do more of that. It's a really good resource, but I just, I've, I've installed it and used it once or twice just to, like, to build a deck, but I've never, I never used it beyond that. I've heard horror stories of people arguing and people cheating because there are no rules in right. force well i think that, i think in this case well, you're playing with somebody you know okay so it just winds yeah. up being an online resource to play with your friends i agree i would not want to be trying to do it with like complete strangers but i think if you have like a deck test group that's probably a really good resource too and i need to probably look into that more i'd be interested in something like yeah, that i'd be willing to try it i mean we already all cheat in person anyway right, so exactly. why not so, do it on the internet it's good practice to practice your cheating online yeah. i agree that's a that's a good call do you, do you guys ever have issues where you get to now we've talked about you get to that 110 mark have you ever built a deck where you get to that 95 mark and you don't know what else is missing if i have and i i kind of have before but it's just because i was being too careful when it came to adding cards and once i'm like oh i'm at 95 well then i might as well go do this and this and this and this and this and this and then i'm at 106 again and (laughs) the opposite problem i have and those have been decks that i've scrapped because it just seems like there wasn't the card base to make sure. the deck yep. work. I, the, I, the reason I ask is I ran into that with Lycia. I was building it on tapped out, and I got to that 97 range, and I'm like, what else am I missing? I had the basic removal for those colors. I had the draw. I had the rocks. I'm like, I can't. What else do I do? And I just hit that, that wall of I need three more cards to level this out, and they can't basic be lands. Lands. Well, no, basic I was lands. already at, <laughs> I was at 38 was lands. I'm like, geez. Just flip a card backwards in your sleeve, and when you draw it, it's whatever you need at that moment. <laughs> wow, <Wild> card. <laughs> <laughs> but no, um, I, I get where you're coming from. Yeah. I have ran into that before. And and maybe that's something, I mean, after last night, I was ready to scrap that deck yeah, and well, just throw it in the garbage. Yeah, and not even because it played badly. It just didn't play. You yeah. just sat there and just First, didn't hit. I didn't cast Lycia until turn 10. Yeah, you just didn't hit anything. Yeah. I would like to, one of these times, actually play that deck and see exactly how it plays. Wait till I fix it. No, I, I would like to play it as it is, and maybe even Dana could play it, yeah. and maybe we could shoot you yeah, sure. ideas. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm in the midst of taking all the Exalted out, so that's what I okay. mean by fix it. So okay. once, you, once you get to that point, then maybe we'll yeah. do some of that, too, um, and then come back and talk. That would be a good kind of deck tech thing to do at some yeah. point, too, for sure. So is there anything that you find yourself forgetting, like things you tend to leave out of decks or, or things you come back later on? You're like, man, I always screw this up. I need to add more of them. For me, I'll tell you what mine is, why I thought of this. Somet- graveyard hate, which we absolutely need in our meta because uh, there's a lot of graveyard interaction in our decks. And that's the one thing I tend to at the last minute or even after playing it once be like, oh man, I have no way to deal with graveyard stuff in this deck. I need to come back and at least find room for one or two spells. I'm always so hesitant with graveyard hate because there's always at least one or two spells in all of my decks that do something with my graveyard. Right. And sure. I never want to be like, Oh, I should put Rest in Peace in my Jeroka deck and then play it and be like, oh, I can't cast Seasons Pass because I don't sure. have a graveyard. And that six mana spell is just sitting there dead now. I could see that. God, for and me, I can't really think of anything that's like that off the top of my head. Another thing, like when I play blue, I try to originally keep the counter spells on the low end. Mm-hmm. And then based on play testing and in the shop. I need one or two more. Over... You know, a course of four weeks, maybe not just the first night. Oh crap, I got my butt kicked. I need to slam every counter spell. And it's no, let's let this ride. I mean, Brago started with two. It started with Render Silent and I think Mystic Confluence. What are you up to now? I think I have five in the deck. 
Well, that's interesting because that's the one I would say that is the same for me as well. My two main decks that are running blue are my Sphinx deck and my. Uh, um, I just forgot his name. Talrand? No, well, Talrand, who I forgot the deck. Just, <laughs> just period, but um, Edric. There we go. Who I don't play very often. This is why I forgot him. Yeah, um, Max but, and I play it more than you right. do. <laughs> but that deck's counterspell count has crept up over the years as well. Both those decks, though, I started off with like three or four counterspells. They're not running a ton now, but like I went from, I think, three in my Sphinx deck is up to six now. And um, Edric went from like three or four, and it's up to seven or so now. I think that happens just because you evolve as a player, and as you grow up, you can afford the better counter spells. Which, right, being able to put a force of will in the deck too, once you're able to afford one, yep. makes a difference and as a, well. And a pact of negation, right. and all those expensive ones that are super good because they're cheap to cast or free yep. for whatever reason. So I guess now thinking about it, probably my biggest fault about something like that would be putting in too many creatures or too little creatures. Okay. And then you actually, like I do a lot of goal fishing, play against myself or whatever. But when I play against someone else, then I'm actually going, oh, I would love to have like three more creatures right now. Or, oh, I would love to pitch these three creatures for removal spells or card draw spells right. or something. I I tend to, I run lean creature decks. Like even my creature heavy decks, like Edric is my heaviest creature deck by far and it's only running 30. And I've seen quite a few. That decks. is super high. That's super high. It, it, yeah. Well, it is, but like, I, well, it is for us. But like, if you look online, I see a lot of decks that aren't even particularly creature centric, um, and they're running like 33, 34 creatures. I'm like, man, that is a lot of creatures for this deck that doesn't seem to really be that concerned about creatures. Are those the decks that also just run 33 lands? They just go a third, maybe, a third, a third. Maybe that's what their thing is. Yeah, it could be. But like after Edric, my highest creature count is my Reki deck is at 25. But that's a deck entirely built around casting creatures to draw cards. And that's still only at 25, whereas a lot of times I'll look and be like, oh, here's somebody's random Hydra deck. I'm like, man, you've got 28 Hydras in your Hydra tribal deck? That seems like a lot. That's a lot There's of, that's that many a lot Hydras seven, to begin that's with? That's a lot of seven drops. <laughs> They're playing at least two colors. Cause oh, I suppose, the, yeah. yeah. There's the one from Guild Pact. Lush. Although, and there's also, I think there's two. Well, you also have the five color with Progenitus. True. That is a Hydra Spirit. Yep. Which I counter every time it hits the field. Yeah, you have, or, or you just lose. Pretty much. That's pretty much, I've given you my, my walkthrough when it comes to me building a deck. That's the basics. Same here. Pretty much. All right, well, as our sign-out conversation, are there any decks anyone's working on right now? Yep. Working on Noyandar, and I'm going to be building Thrasios, if I'm pronouncing that right, for multiplayer. The blue-green two-drop that scry, four to scry? Yep, and I'm building another deck, which we had discussed, <laughs> but apparently we're not doing it now. Or not in the near future, I don't the, know. The goblin one? No. The merfolk. Oh, merfolk. The we're going to battle merfolk, and yeah. I was going to run Empress Galena. We'll do that at some point, yeah. for sure. Okay, because I started sketching it up, and I haven't heard back from you guys. I'm like, was I supposed to do this, or was we'll, I not supposed yeah, to do we'll, this? We'll do or? it at some point before Christmas. I'm not sure when. We'll do it this fall. Okay. What we're going to do is we're each going to we each built a merfolk tribal deck, choosing different color combinations, and we're going to actually play I mean, we won't. I probably won't actually buy the cards. I'll no. just probably proxy it out. But we're going to try three different ways to build Merfolk Tribal and kind of throw them together and see which one wins. Maybe we could try cock- Cockatrice with this. There we go. I mean, there we go. Maybe that's I'm, what we'll do. It's going to be Empress Galena, and I'm stealing your commanders all, right. all day long. <laughs> well, luckily, our commanders are all bad in Merfolk. Yes. Well, I actually have an Empress Galena. That's why I chose yeah. that. I so. do, too. <laughs> I have one as well. I think everyone went digging through their bulk box when that price yeah. went up. So you're working on that one, obviously. But what's the Merfolk one you're working on? A Thrasios. And that's so you're running the green blue. Green merfolk. blue, because okay. of all these new green Merfolk, I think it should play better synergistic wise, putting counters on, um, doing stuff like that. How about, and what's the one v one the one you're working on? Noyandar, the Noyandar blue one. white. Okay. And is that just mostly going to be with like the awaken effects and land interaction kind of stuff? Yep, card draw, counter spells, removal. Um, going to play a few swords in it because you never know if I have to start suiting them up to sure, do right. commander beats. How about you, Max? Anything on your well, radar? Kind of like I said earlier, I like to build more for the archetypes. Okay. So, like, my Dramoka deck is my Battle Cruiser deck. My Brago deck's the control deck. Lyceo was supposed to be a Voltron deck. I don't know if that's going to happen in the end. But I realized I don't have a token deck. And so I'm trying to slowly piece one together. I don't know what color combinations. I want to avoid Reese just because it's Reese sure. and it gets hated. But. I wish there was a good Bant uh, token, token general because Dana and I were talking the other day that my two 
really good decks are green, white, and blue, white, so that would make Bant. Sure. But my first three-color deck that I really built and put time into was a Mardu. Right. So I wish there was a Bant token guy, but there really isn't. They're mostly about blinking or tapping stuff down. Yeah, the Bant commanders are actually kind of uninspiring, all, all told. Yeah considering that it's a, it's a very popular right. color combination. The commanders aren't great. If I had to choose a Bant, I would probably use Derevi just because of uh, her tap ability. Okay, sure. Do uh, tribal tokens with birds? No. <laughs> There's no green bird tokens. You, just birds of paradise. Doubling, having doubling season is really nice. There is more than just birds of paradise. There is whippoorwill. Come on now. <laughs> I think he doesn't have flying, though. <laughs> it I, does I, have flying. I'm pretty sure it has it, flying. Uh, so... I'm working on that. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I should. My goal is to have that done by early 2018. Okay. I kind of. I, I haven't put that much thought into it yet, but I played Patrick's Relentless Rats deck last night, and it was fun. Um, but then it got me thinking. I, I have a bunch of Shadowborn Apostles because at one point in time I had an Athreos Apostles deck. Um, and I don't want to build Athreos again. Um, so I might try Secukar, Secuar the Death Keeper. He's Jund. Um, I think he was in Cold Snap originally, and then he was reprinted in the Prosh deck. Uh, whenever yep. a creature you control dies, you make a 3-1 Graveborn token. Oh, interesting. So I thought I might try him with the Shadowborn Apostles, because if I'm going to sacrifice six of them to get, you know, Razakath or something, why not make six creatures that I can then sacrifice to Razakath to get a bunch of stuff. So I might try that. We'll see. I haven't really thought it much beyond... Literally today when like I'm like, oh, that rat stack was kind of cool, and I've got a bunch of apostles. Maybe I should look at that again. So that's a possibility. Um, I have a couple other decks I've kind of been kicking around. but Ooh, I want to hear it because your, your ideas are always just genius. I, w- I wouldn't go that far. but I don't know. Didgeridoo is just <laughs> awesome. <laughs> the one thing I was kind of thinking about was Vela the Nightclad because um, she gives all your creatures. Intimidate. Intimidate. And I was oh, thinking maybe. Fear? Uh, is it fear? I'm one, of the, one of the two. I was thinking maybe trying a morph deck with her, because all your morphs are then colorless. Yeah, if it is intimidate, that would it be is amazing. Intimidate. Yeah, she also has when an, her or another creature dies or leaves the battlefield, not just dies, yep. leaves the battlefield. Each opponent loses a life, so you could start blinking stuff. Because I think there was a, I think she came in the, uh, was a plane chase or was it? She was in one of the plane chase, and she was reprinted this year in the com- in the wizard deck. And in the plane chase set, she was with a bunch of ninjas, so. Mm-hmm. The pr- you're supposed to play her and then attack with a ninja and then have it leave the battlefield to have another creature come into play and that would deal damage. Um, I think that's there's not enough stuff that the, that exits and enters to really take advantage of that ability. And she's six mana, that's a ton too. Whereas I figure I thought with morph, so he said you can do morph stuff as well in addition to her. You don't rely on her as much, but when she's out, then all of a sudden your morphs are swinging for for unblockable damage mostly. Are there enough? Black morphs. I know there's probably there's enough few, blue. There's, there's enough in blue. There's a few in black, but I don't know how, how many of them are good. But okay. there's, the blue ones are, are usually pretty good. There's quite a few good blue ones. Thank you, Cons Block. Yes, right. That helped a lot. Thank you for coming back again in Iconic Masters, too. Yes. yes. Um, so anyway, that's that's kind of my plan there is to maybe take a look at that as well. So that's what's brewing for me. Cool, cool. I think that's it for us. So can I send a challenge out to people? I want to see a picture from someone. Sure, yeah, man. Now, the new wizard who creates cage tokens. Okay. I want to see somebody get a small bird cage, have fishing wire hang from it, with the little soft plastic clamps, and every time you cage something, I want to see that card hanging in the cage during a game. Have it, like, for your prop for the game? (laughs) Yes. I would love to see that, because I thought about doing it, but then I moved away from that strategy. What made you think of doing that? (laughs) Just because I thought I would just love to sit down, Set my commander down, then set my cage right next to me and just see everyone's face go, oh, God, no. Someone asked me the other day about Marisil, Um, because he's a cool commander. I mean, you can definitely do some powerful things, and I've seen a lot of discussion of if you cage this thing, you can then interact with this. And I like cool interactions using obscure cards, but for him, every time I hear people start talking about it, I'm just like, that's just too much work. Like the, whole, <laughs> the whole thing, like everything with him just sounds like too much reading. I just don't, nope, I am not interested. That's See, And that's why the cage is there because then it's, you just set it in the <laughs> center guess. of the table and everyone can just be like, okay, so there's that card and that card and that card. And... Was it was it our friend Justin? Somebody used to ha- has a custom uh, throne of bone that they've taken or whatever it is. That yes, whenever it is on, Justin. Whenever you're on the throne with Marchesa, you get the throne. Yep. That, that was pretty cool. All right, that is it for us. Thank you. We'll be back next week. I'm Dana. I'm Max. And I'm Chris.